Well, the difference between a dream and a fantasy, like winning the lottery, is that in a dream, you can actually do something about it. When it comes to lottery tickets, short of buying a ticket, buying a lot of tickets, doing a lot of hoping, there's nothing you can do to make it happen. But there's a paradox in dreaming, because if you never go to strategy, the dream remains a fantasy or a nice idea. However, in my travels around the world, primarily what I see is that we tend to go to strategy too quickly. The realist in us wants to know where you're going to get the time and where you're going to get the money, and we wind up compromising our dreams down to what we realistically think is possible. At Dream University, our mission is to literally change how you think about, speak about, and act upon your dreams. So instead of it being a maybe someday, after the kids are gone, or after I retire, the question we like you to ask is, what's important to you, and what are you willing to do about it? So moving out of the fantasies, your dreams are basically what matters to you, uh, personally and professionally, and what action are you going to take to make those dreams real? Now, I've had the privilege over the last many years to actually train close to 1,200 life coaches. We call them dream coaches, of course. That's our brand, dream coaches. And um, I'm really honored to tell you that this work of helping people get clear about what they do and don't want, believing in themselves, and taking action on those dreams is being taught in corporations, school systems, nonprofits, uh, in the... Uh, corporate world, but also in prisons and in shelters. And if you're here and you have a nonprofit, please see me sometime during this day because I have, I have stuff I want to give you to help and support you in making your dream a reality. Now, some years ago, Nine West Shoes sent their HR director from China to California to study with me to become a certified dream coach. And uh, she took this information back to China and was really using it to help the employees think about their career development. Pretty cool and cutting edge for China when you think about it. And I was invited over a few months after she worked with me, and I spoke to a room like this. There were about 400 people in the room. And now think about it, they were in the shoemaking business. So 200 of the people were involved with the, tan and the tanning and the hides and the leathers. They spoke Portuguese. 200 people were involved with the dyes and the cuts and assembling the shoes. They spoke Mandarin. And here I am, in English, talking to them about their dreams. And although people were smiling and nodding, I wondered if they really knew what the heck I was talking about. So I opened the floor for questions, and a young girl in the back waves at me, and I called her onto the stage and handed her a microphone. And I don't think she had ever held a microphone before because her hand was shaking like a leaf. And what she said was, Marsha, no one ever told me that I could dream. She said, people told me to be a good girl. They told me to work hard, to get good grades. They told me to be quiet. They told me that a lot, she said. Now she's like warmed up with the microphone. <laughs> they told me that a lot. She said, but now that you've told me that my dreams matter, I'm going to tell everyone I know. And I thought about it later. You know, on one hand, like my heart leapt for her. I was so excited for her. And on the other hand, I got a little nervous because after all, it is a communist country. Like, what was the dinner table conversation like that night? Well, she went on and she organized the first neighborhood cleanup project in her little community and went on to do some pretty amazing things. I left China, I came home to my own beloved America, back to California where I live, and I looked out and primarily what I saw was a nation that had stopped dreaming. I saw people who were afraid to get on an airplane, and at one level it was understandable. I saw people who were afraid to uh, invest $100 in their heartfelt dream, and that wasn't okay with me. I got concerned, I got scared, I got sad, and to tell you the truth, I became a woman with a mission! And this mission, thank you, you're sweet, this mission is called the dream movement, and the whole idea is that with one step, you're in action on your dream. Over here, you're in reality thinking, gee, maybe someday. But with one step, you demonstrate to the world around you and to yourself that you're not just talking about it, you're actually doing something about it. And then as I started looking more closely, I realized the dream movement is not just about any old step. There's a very specific and critical step we need to take. Because most of us stand with one foot firmly planted in reality, be realistic, this voice says. How many of you have hardcore realist? 
Show of hands, come on. Thank you for your honesty. Be realistic, this part says, and the other foot firmly planted in our doubt. And the realist says, you shouldn't do that, and the doubter says, and here's why. And by the way, nothing activates that doubter more than saying you're going to do one thing and not doing anything at all. It goes into the file cabinet. There he goes again, talking about his dream. There she goes, just talking about it, not doing anything about it. So this, we have one foot in reality and one foot in our doubt. And the work that I encourage you to do with me is to take one very critical step. Step into your dream. Slide this doubter foot over into reality. Reality is an important part of the mix. You have to know where you are in order to design the strategy for where you want to go. But the question is, what has being realistic cost you? It's been medically proven, study at Columbia University, that people with passion and dreams live seven to 10 years longer and obviously have a better quality of life. There's even a medical term for it. Dr. Mehmet Oz taught me this personally, apoptosis. Apoptosis, which can come in at any age, is when your brain believes you've outgrown your usefulness. We see it most often when people retire, of course, get laid off, experience an empty nest, all you empty nesters, but also when we stop dreaming, the brain sends a message to the body that it's no longer needed, and we start to mentally or physically self-destruct. So what's the cure? passion and dreams. Connected to your passion, you have more energy, more enthusiasm. Connected to your dreams, you have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And this, you know, at all ages. So uh, we have something on called the Million Dreams Campaign. And people come in, it's completely free. People come in, they register their dreams and support each other in taking what we call WOW. Within one week, what action step are you going to take to demonstrate you're more committed to your dreams than to your doubts, fears, or reality? So this is one of the posts that we saw. Bessie, at 70 years old, said that she was tired of being an amateur photographer and wanted to be a world-class professional photographer. And I said to her, this is a great dream. What are you doing about it? And she said, well, nothing. I said, why not? She said, well, I think I need credentials, but I don't want to go back to school at this age. And then I said to her, Bessie, what's really stopping you? You know, it's like you can hear what's in the unspoken. She said, everybody is telling me I'm too old. My own friends are telling me to be realistic. And I said, well, that's just nonsense. What's a step you can take to demonstrate you're more committed to your dream than to their doubt? She goes, I know what I can do. She said, I've had an application for this Kodak contest sitting in my inbox for a month. I'm going to enter the contest. I'm going to prove to them, and more importantly, to myself, that I'm serious about my dream. So she took this great photograph of a man playing a sousaphone with red and golden tones reflected in the instrument. She sends it off to the Kinza Awards, this Kodak International Newspaper Snapshots Award contest, with 500,000 other people. She won first prize. She won $10,000. She ran out and got business cards printed. I am a professional, I get paid. Her photograph toured around the world with the Journey into Imagination exhibit. I said to her, what did you learn? What wisdom would you share? She looked me square in the eye and said, it's never too late to make a dream come true. And what I add to Bessie's wisdom is this, that until you get to the end of your life and you look back on what you did or didn't accomplish, how do you know when something is realistic? What most of us do is we compromise our dreams down to what we think and believe is realistic. And let's go to the other end of the spectrum from 70, let's go to 14. So I was speaking at a PTA meeting. Dad's there with his 14-year-old daughter. Mom's working late that night. He turns to her, he says, honey, tell me one of your dreams. And with the sweetest little face, she says, daddy, my dream is to be a teacher. And I waited for the response. Because the logical response these days is, oh, that's a, <laughs> yay, yay. <laughs> the logical head response might be something like teachers don't make enough money. But he gave her the dream coach response. Honey, you'd make a great teacher. Anyone that had you as a teacher would be so lucky. And her little face just like lit up. And I thought about it later. Maybe the most important thing for this child isn't about making a lot of money. Maybe it's about being a great teacher.
You know, or maybe because somebody said, I believe in you. Maybe she'll be the one who revamps the educational system. You know, so please, please, please talk to your kids about their dreams and don't be like a friend of mine who called me up recently. Marsha, Marsha, my six-year-old wants to be a Kmart checker. <laughs> what should I do? I said, tell her she'll be great. And call me when she wants to be a rock and roll star. We'll have something to talk about. You know, and when I think about big dreamers also, um, I want to share a little Oprah story with you. God bless her. She's been through it. You know, just the whole range. Um, the first time I was ever on national television, I was on the Oprah Winfrey show, and the show was live. And the show was about um, inspiring people to go for their dreams. Good casting, you know? And I had never been on television before, and I walked out on the stage, and um, basically blurted out, Oprah, what was your dream when you started your business? Now, they told me after the show that Oprah asks the questions, and she was lovely with me. She said her dream was to create a company where people could have fun. Then she went on to her big vision. Her dream was to create an organization where people would come together, together, make a contribution, and then give back to the world. The audience went crazy. Yeah, doing it, Oprah. And I'll give you a little hint. It was Arsenio Hall days. So what were they doing? Woo, 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 woo. They're barking. Woo, woo, woo. We are doing it, Oprah. And when the energy was at this really high fevered pitch, Oprah took the microphone and said, and Marsha, what's your dream? Now let me tell you. The number one way to experience ease and shortcuts on any dream is to share your dream with other people. But most of us don't want to. If I tell you my dream, you might laugh at me. I might fail, and what will you think of me? You might steal my idea. We hear that one. But the really big reason why we don't want to share our dreams is because if I tell you my dream, you might expect me to do something about it. How many of you get it? I just want to see. That's why, by the way, coaching has become a multi-billion dollar industry. Because when we tell somebody else, a friend, a family member, a professional, we share our dream, we're, you know, it's like there's no place to hide. It's out. That's why we want you to share your dreams and post your dreams. Go public with it. So Oprah, you know, you know, she, you know the energy's at this really high fevered pitch. And Marsha, what's your dream? And I'm thinking, uh-uh. 35 million people and my mother are watching. <laughs> so I took a deep breath and I said, my dream is that we'll have dreams again and that we'll open our calendars and schedule the date that we're going to take action on the dream. We went to commercial break and here's a behind the scenes Oprah story. So Oprah came up to me during the commercial break. She put her hands on my shoulders and kind of got down like this eye to eye with me. And she said to me, Marsha, you know something that I know. All I could think was, I'm having a moment with Oprah. <laughs> my ears filled up with cotton, like she, her mouth was moving. I'm hearing nothing. I got nothing here. And I could hear my mother in the back of my mind kind of going, when someone's talking to you and you're not listening, smile and act like you are. So I'm sitting there like this. <laughs> and I snapped myself out of it just in time to hear Oprah Winfrey say, Marsha, you know something that I know. It's all about believing in your dreams. Oprah Winfrey said that if she had to attribute her success in life to any one thing, it was that she believed in her dreams even when no one else did. And what I'll add briefly is this. Sometimes there's no evidence that your dream is a good idea or that this is the right time to pursue it. But the question is, where are you looking for evidence? Do not look in your checkbook. Don't look at the stock market. Don't look to other people to decide whether or not you believe in your dream. The only place to look is in your own heart. And the $64,000 question is this. Can you believe in your dreams, not because there are promises, guarantees, or assurances, but simply because they matter to you? And can you believe enough where you'll put a stake in the ground and take a stand for who you are and for what really matters to you most? When we come together at events like this, we have an opportunity to realize that we're not alone and to share your dreams with your loved ones, to encourage your spouses, your children, your colleagues at work. It's important to know the people who work for us, what are they working for? We work for a check, but what we do with the check is what we're really passionate about. So let's find out what our dreams are, and let's create a culture 
that is really about faith at a practical level. Because I think as we restore dreaming, we are restoring faith, we're restoring hope, we're restoring empowerment, and look, we can even redefine what the American dream really means. It was giving a talk. Should you think that some of your dreams are too big, or some of your obstacles are really going to get in the way, like how much you have in the checkbook, because there's a reality around that. I was giving a talk in Portland, Oregon, and this young man came up to me, very tall, very unusual, and he said to me, Thank you for your talk today. It really touched my heart. I needed to hear your message. And he said, I'm a long way from home. I said, oh, I travel a lot too. And he said, well, this might be a little different. This is the first time in my life I've ever been away from my tribe. I stopped what I was doing. Your tribe? Who are you? Where are you from? He said, I'm from Kenya, Africa, and I'm part of the Maasai warrior tribe. I said, well, what are you doing in Portland? You know? He said, when I was very young, I became ill. And my mother took me to a nearby clinic, to a medical clinic. And the doctor healed me. And from that day forward, my dream is to become a doctor. But it's impossible. He said, there's no training available. And you don't leave the tribe. It just isn't done. He said, I kept the dream alive in my heart. I shared it with everybody. And everybody rolled their eyes at me, told me that it was a fantasy, and told me to forget it. He said, recently, around my 18th birthday, a visitor came from your country to my country, and he was a, a reporter for the Washington Post. He interviewed me. He interviewed our tribe members. He wrote my story. He said, in a matter of weeks, a couple in Portland, Oregon, read it, and in a few months, I was invited to apply for undergraduate work at the University of Portland. And I looked at him, and I said, that, that's incredible. That must have been the happiest day of your life. And he said to me, it was the worst. He said it was the most horrific day of my life because on one hand, I was being handed my dream, but my family had no money. They had no resources to send me off to America to follow a dream. He said, Marsha, I did the only thing I had left in my pocket to do. I got on my hands and knees, and I prayed for a miracle, and that's what I got. Four families came forward. Each one made a commitment, one year apiece, to feed me, to house me, to buy my books, to basically love me and be my family while I was so far from home. Well, I was a puddle. I still get so emotional just thinking about it. And what he said next always stayed with me. He said, you know, it wasn't until today when I heard you speak so passionately about dreams that I got really clear about what I need to do. He said, of course I'm going to become a doctor. That's my dream, no question. But now I know. I must go home. I must go back to my tribe and back to my people and be an example that no dream is impossible and the extraordinary things that can happen when we come together. And my friends, that's what America needs from us right now. That's what your companies need. You know, that's what our schools need to re be reminded that our dreams matter and it's never been a better or more important time to actually go for those dreams. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks very much.